Okie dokie, artichokies. So, I'm here to talk about creating layers for NFT art projects. I wrote about it. You guys are searching for it quite a bit. I didn't cover it to its fullest extent in this article, but tonight and right now, I'm going to go over some tips and tricks, give you a little bit more in this video on creating different layers for NFT art projects and how that applies to uh, generative art projects using uh, randomizer engines like the one that Hashlips provides. So stay tuned. Here we go. Cool. So don't mind my desktop. It's been kind of hectic here. Uh, but let's talk about layers. In the actual article, I talked about layers from the perspective of Procreate and you know what you could do there and how you could kind of set things up. But in this particular article, I'm going to go over what I did to create war skulls and kind of talk about a technique that I used from this one single image to get to the final composition and all the randomized ones. Um, so let me just close the shit that I don't really use often or like. And we'll just jump into it. So if you're familiar with NFTs, I got fucking ash on my keyboard. If you're familiar with NFTs, then you know, you've definitely seen profile picture projects and you've certainly seen you know, a whole variety of randomized or, you know, generated multi-layer type projects. So what this does is this covers that kind of a project. Oh, my bad. Hold on. Shut up, dog. So here it is, right? When you go to create the layers, it's, it's, it's really as simple as creating a new file. Whatever size, you know, it doesn't really matter creating those layers within your document, within your file. But what you want to make sure, and the real trick, let me just do a little doodle here. Real dog. The real trick is no matter what, you know, is on those layers, you want to make sure when you output them individually, wherever they have to go. So for example, if I turned that bitch off and said export, quick export, see you, my bad, going too fast, you wouldn't want to do quick export. If I did export, you know, export as, you want to make sure that the canvas size stays 1188 by 1080, uh, 1098, whatever it is when you set up your document for all of them. You heard Larry Bird? The reason being, because when you use randomizers like Hashlips, it's going through a series of directories and it's grabbing files and making sure, you know, based on the weighting that the name of the actual file is given, you know, that it's coming to the party, right? It'll pull it out and say, boom, bam, here's where you go, buddy. If it's not the right size, it's not gonna line up. There's no reference point you know, other than probably zero, zero up in the top left corner. I personally didn't go through it, you know, to a fine tooth comb. It's open source. You can dig through the code, but I trust him enough. You know, it works and I got it to work the way I wanted to. His explanations basically say the same thing that I'm saying right now. Make sure your layers are the right size. So that's the key number one, right? Anytime you go to output them, make sure they're the right size. Now, the trick is really knowing what the hell you're going to make and what you're going to output. For War Skulls, it took me a while to kind of come to the conclusion on how I wanted to break down each individual layer and how I wanted to compose this document. So what I'm going to I'll do now is just turn all this shit off and show you how I thought through the process and how I deconstructed my original image um, because I don't think that production art is often talked about. And production art is really kind of the thinking and the process on how to go to come up with something like this. So I don't really want to start so you can see the full visual. You know, all right, actually, I'll start at the top. I have this layer here called shadow, and it's all the way at the top because I had to go through and knock out each individual shape 
right? And then build up a layer that included all of the shadows uh, for those particular layers underneath it. And what I mean by that is in order to get this to work in the way I needed it to work when I ran it through the randomizer, I had to have only the shadow aspects on this shadow layer and on top of everything because I knew the shadow was going to stay black, right? I knew it wasn't going to change. I knew it was going to have this hard crisp edge. And no matter what variation, it was going to pull out, you know, 100% of the shadow. Where it really got saucy, and as you can see, these little anchor icons, um, ignore this effect, that's not supposed to be there. But as you can see, these anchor icons, that is um, a smart object. And I'll dive into it and I'll tell you why. But I built up each individual layer based on the piece that I was trying to create and... Uh, you could think of this a couple different ways. You could think of it like stacking glass. You could think of it like stacking paper. You know, I used to do like uh, cut paper type artwork and or collage type artwork. You know, so that's where this thing, this comes from. But really, you're just stacking. You're ordering. You're layering. So however you can use your mind's eye and your vision to layer those layers and think through how each of these things should go, you know, that's what you should really do. So right here, you'll see I have a skull and I have a skull outline. So in the composition, you can't really see it too well here, but you can kind of see it a little bit. You know, this skull actually has a thick border and a thick outline. I knew that the skull, the skull outline, the roses up here in the top corner, the roses, you know, they needed an outline. The wreath, the wreath outline, I knew that all of these elements I wanted to have control over and put some form of a constraint on in the randomization process. And that's where all of uh, these smart objects started to come into play because where the generative, like generation randomization comes in are all these different layers. So once I, to recap before we get into this aspect, once I thought through the composition and how I wanted each individual layer to stack and then render in kind of an order of importance. Developers, you could think of this as the Z index. Um, if I don't know what other kind of people would think of like a Z index or a, or a you know the Z scale, not, not X or the Y axes, but a Z. You get it. It's coming at you. You know, a scale of depth. Just think through it like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but. The reason I started doing these smart objects is because this is where I came in, you know, to start building out the variations of the actual object. And you can use this technique honestly for anything, right? You could use it for any type of object. I just particularly wanted to use a skull and I wanted to have control over, uh, let me turn this shit off real quick. I wanted to have control over potentially future variations. I don't, I'm not going to work with this war skulls concept, it was pretty cool. Uh, for the idea and for what I was doing it for at the time. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, at this stage, and if you've been following along with any of the content that I've been creating, most of this NFT stuff has been very experimental and very much in a way to empower others similarly to what we're talking about tonight. Um, but so you'll see the reason I used all these smart objects and broke them out into their own individual layers in a completely different file was to, to maintain that control, to have that variation, to have that ability. But also, I don't know how the color would react to each individual application, and I wanted to be able to make adjustments to the skull if need be. Um, in some cases, I had to. In most cases, I didn't. But when I use, you know, a trick that I use are these, these uh, layer styles and these overlays and stuff, and that's how I kind of get and create effects and that's how I end up here. One thing I'm not able to show because I did flatten the layer is, you'll see this texture here, and you can see my pointer. In the final composition, I have a textured layer uh, over everything, right? And it looks like it would easily be just one layer, but that's not the case. Maybe it's in another one here and I'll look. Um, no, these are all flattened. What I did, and I guess maybe it's probably my pension for overcomplicating things sometimes. Um, I'm not going to save this either. So, but you get it. I, oh, well, hold on. I want to tell you something. 
what I did was I had to go into each individual object and each individual object's variant and apply a, a masked version of the layer, you know, and then merge it down to get the final asset. So if we go back over here, this goldenrod skull top layer turned on right now, that's the final asset that gets output from Photoshop on this massive transparent, you know, sheet of imaginary glass, right? So I had to go through each individual time and do that. Um, it was kind of a pain in the ass, but again, that's this is the production aspect, and this is what I think is really valuable and people to understand that you could right click and save all you want, go for it. That's not what this is about. This is about ownership, this is about data, this is about an underlying technology, and this is about what it was early on, you know, protecting artists. Digital art takes a long time. You know, when you look at movies and stuff, you realize there's massive teams that are behind it. When you see these simple graphics, you know, they're not as simple as you think. So I just want to point that out that there's a lot of thought that goes into digital artwork. There's a lot of thought that goes into technology and things um, of the like. So enough of my rant. The point is, in order to create layers for an NFT in Photoshop or any other project, think through the composition. You know, I didn't arrive at this conclusion straight away. You know, here's here's something that happened. Here's part of my process, right? I didn't arrive right there and say, oh, that's how I was going to do it. It took me a fucking month to come up with the structure. I was doing a lot of other shit at the same time, but it took me a fucking month. If we go here, um, so PSBs are massive Photoshop documents, and that's how big my shit was getting because I actually went through this entire process here to initially plan what I was trying to do and how I was going to structure my uh, collection. And I don't have a shitty Mac. I got a top of the line Mac. I always make sure technology, right? Look how this motherfucker is crawling like your grandmother on Sunday. This shit is slow right now because this is a file. This file is so big. I am happy that Mac came back with those monster desktops that they had when I was a kid. You know, too bad they're like more than a fucking house. Come on, guys. But if you want to hook me up with one, that'll be dope. My birthday is in July. Anyway, as this shit loads right quick, see now I'm talking shit. Now it doesn't want to work. But that's how big it is. So, you know, as we wait for this, if you think any of this is helpful, please leave some comments or whatever. If you think it sucks, let me know. I'll make it better. Um, from time to time, I'll continue to share different tips and tricks on you know, what I can do and how I can do them and how I can help you from my perspectives um, and maybe answer some questions on how to create digital art. Um, and we'll go from there. And Well, maybe it's because of the screen recording software too. I'm too impatient. Cool. Uh, I had to close Photoshop and re-jimmy that motherfucker back open. But, so, peep this. And I'm not going to keep this open for long because it gets fuzzy when I have this document open. I'm not going to really dick around with moving. Um, the early stages of me planning this, I had to, you know, start thinking through the different assets and, and then how I wanted to break it down. Uh, so, you know, I have these isolated objects, these concepts, these different variations. I started to plan out how I wanted to break things down and what I was thinking about the collectible collection to be like color compositions and so on and so forth. And that's really where I started the ideation, you know, behind how I was going to create my layers and how I was going to break stuff apart. I'm wondering if I have anything else, but, um, you know, it kind of became something like this and I worked through this process as well you know here's some more early stage planning where it, eh, god damn it gosh darn it sorry Catholics and Christians I don't mean to offend you I don't mean to offend anybody but I've been working on my filter so fuck off if you don't like it um yeah right so this is how I kind of thought through all right here's the different color variations that I might want to apply uh, these are the ways I want to try them and you'll see here in this aspect right I created this burst or what have you but I knew that I needed to have a duplicate there because you know I also want to work through 
how the colors are going to apply and affect the different layers and the different backgrounds and the textures and the different assets. And what I mean by that is like, you know, for example, if I turn this sandstone off, you can see that I lose a lot of that texture. This becomes more 3D. This is a whole different look. Um, but when I turn this on, I can see that this is very grungy. This is very gritty. So I have to think through the entire composition. And that's something that you're going to have to do too. And that goes back to my earlier comment where I had to actually mask and isolate, you know, each individual grouping or layer, uh, cut, you know, basically out what I didn't need or stencil what I didn't need for the texture and then apply it to that asset. Um, and that sounds complicated as fuck, but it's really not. Once you do have the asset, for example, this skull, it's as simple as clicking com uh, command or control on your keyboard on a Mac and clicking on the image of the layer and you'll see the marching ants that come around it. Um, shortcut shift command I inverts the layer and you could ch chippity chop the motherfucking shit that you don't dizzy won't and then shift command I reverts back but uh, yeah so command D lets that motherfucker go and all them bitches are clear. Uh, that's really all I got for you. So that is how you create layers for an NFT project. That is how you create layers in Photoshop. That is a lot about some of the process that I follow or think through when I create digital artwork. Don't save that. That's a lot of some tips and techniques. And I guess, you know, too, I can go in other videos more about other shit. But anyways... I hope that helps and you know feel free to reach out with any questions I'd be happy to answer whatever I can you can find me uh, at Dane Masalko on Twitter Instagram all that malarkey peace and love people peace and love <laughs>